Ross Institute, giving lectures on apomexis. And he thought of visiting his student professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Venkatesh Bhatt at DSR. So he thought of visiting Ikrasat again. So thanks, John, for making it to Ikrasat. He's not new to Ikrasat. He's one more student, uh, Oscar, who used to be our research program director. Um, also worked with him after his MSc and after his PhD also, yeah, for some time. And they also had a paper on apomixis. So our, his association with Ikrasat goes a little bit longer than what we thought. He has also visited, his, his PhD is from Texas A&M in 1982. And from that day, he's working on apomixis. His interest in sorghum started in 1998. It brought him to Ikrasat in 2000 for a couple of weeks. And he knows a bit older names of Ikrasat at that time. And today we just, I thought of asking him to give a seminar and I just thank John for making it for us. So just for sake of information, he has just published a paper on sorghum last year in BMC Plant Genetics, so on sorghum. So that's something that we would be also interested. So John, it's all yours now. Thank you, Santosh. I appreciate the, the inventor, invitation to be here today and to speak to all of you about apomixis. It has a, a very uh, challenging, in some sense, uh, history in terms of understanding what apomixis is. We say apomixis is asexual seed formation when we're talking about plants. Asexual seed formation this is the formation of an unreduced egg inside of an, embry an embryo sac or an ovule. That egg then develops spontaneously, parthenogenetically, without being fertilized into an embryo for the next generation. The embryo is an exact clone of the female plant. So for since the 1930s, when hybrid crops were first introduced, geneticists first figured out how to make hybrid corn, uh, people have thought about apomixis as a biological mechanism that could perpetuate hybrid vigor year after year after year for farmers so that they could maintain that hybrid vigor. Hybrids could go into all parts of the world, just like uh, outcross. Out, 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 out crossed uh, plants do today. So there's, an, there's been an, an interest in apomixis since uh, the 1930s and 40s when that was first recognized that if we could harness this, this phenotype of clonal seed formation and put it into uh, first generation F1 hybrids, it would be a phenomenal advancement in agriculture. And since the 1940s, there's been lots of money pumped into this dream. Some people have called it a holy grail. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, frankly, I'm not sure that we yet understand what apomixis really is. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I understand some of you are biologists outside of the field of plants or cell biology that may have even more understanding in terms of what apomixis is in animals or insects, many of which are, have what we call apomictic parthenogenesis. So we'll talk about, I'll talk about apomixis for just a few minutes. Uh, with regard to what it, what we are beginning to see as, as what it really, really is, it's not just asexual seed formation induced by spontaneous mutations. We think now that it is an ancient program, may have evolved along with sexual reproduction during eukaryogenesis, the genesis of eukaryotes from from bacteria, and maybe an alternative program to sexual reproduction that existed then, and the capacity for apomixis has been retained in various kingdoms of eukaryotes. Okay, that's getting a little ahead of the story, but I did want to 
want to mention that. I talked about it as being asexual seed formation. This definition is fine for us that are working with angiosperms or seed plants, but it doesn't really identify the mechanisms. Within the last 15, 20 years, we've talked about defining apomixis as replacement of meiosis with apomyosis. So instead of having a reduction division, you skip reduction, you still produce an egg, but it's genetically, it's just a mitotically produced egg, so it's genetically identical to the mother. And then you're replacing syngamy or fertilization with parthenogenesis, which is the formation of an embryo from an unfertilized egg. So that's been a nice definition. It's really good in a definition for plants. Gametophytic apomixis is, uh, is uh, the formation of an unreduced embryo sac, an unreduced egg. But it's not good for, for all apomix. Sporophytic apomixis is, we talk about it as being adventitious embryoni, where an embryo develops from the nucellus of the ovule. It, it really isn't a modification of sporophytic apomixis, adventitious embryoni, is not a modification of meiosis or syngamy. It's a modification within a new cell or cell that then has the capacity to restart the life cycle from a single cell. Okay. That, uh, so this definition, replacement, meiosis and syngamy, doesn't really work. The definition that we are, in my laboratory, we're, we're just arriving at, and it's going to be published in a review article here soon, is that apomixis is life cycle renewal from a single cell without meiosis and syngamy. The important part is life cycle renewal from a single cell, just like an egg, but it's not an egg, it's an asexual process. But all of the epigenetic reprogramming that occurs in an egg is present in this single cell, meaning it can start afresh. Uh, we, are, we are old people here. I'm older than probably the rest of, rest of you, maybe. <laughs> But, uh, but we, have the we have the capability of tree creating a child that starts afresh. And that's, isn't that a phenomenal thing? And apomixis has that capacity to do that without the sexual process. Okay. Um, so I started researching apomixis in other kingdoms back in 2005. And I put together a picture like this shortly in 2005, after, after we had exhausted some approaches to understand apomixis just in angiosperms. We started to look at where apomixis is in the, uh, in the phylogeny of, of all eukaryotes. And these boxes here that have green in them, the green boxes here, those are uh, places where apomixis is, exists and has been found. It's also been found in the Viria de Plante and the Rhodophyta. So you can see that apomixis, it, wherever meiosis has occurred or occurs, we see that apomixis also occurs. And this is just an example of, of some apomictic organisms. Uh, Komodo dragons, some sharks, lots of insects, replace meiosis with an apomyotic division where an egg forms. But from that egg, unfertilized egg, a new organism develops afresh. So lots of, that's just the title slide of, of one of the presentations I gave last week. So apomixis uh, exists at what we call the haplontic stage in protists and some algae where they spend most of their lifetime as haploids. And, uh, and typically, stress will induce syngamy in the formation of tolerant zygospores. 
But in many, in many of these organisms, these protists and algae, apomixis comes in. And if the conditions are not stressful, we will find the formation of a spore, an unreduced, or well in this case, a haploid spore, that is reprogrammed to restart the haplontic life cycle. If it's a multicellular algae, for instance, it will start from a, an asexually formed spore and start that multicellular process all over again. So if we look at this diagram here, we know that meiosis and syngamy, those processes re involve a chromatin reset and an epigenetic reprogramming in, that makes meiosis possible and syngamy a requirement for further progression in the life cycle. Alternatively, we have apomeiosis, and we now have evidence, and I'll present in a few minutes, that apomeiosis is an alternative epigenetic reprogramming of the cell that produces a cell that can develop parthenogenetically, does not require fertilization for its advancement. And so my research is aimed at trying to understand the epigenetic differences that are programming cells either for a sexual pathway or an apomictic pathway. Programming cells, okay. So uh, sort of a summary of this, we have sex and apomixis in these uh, diplontic protists and algae. Uh, although this isn't a summary, this just shows in the diplontic uh, eukaryote, we have the same type of thing where they spend most of their life cycle as a diploid. Uh, and we have a life cycle reset, a complete reset. It starts before meiosis. You, oftentimes, meiosis is induced by stress. And then we have in many of these organisms an apomictic alternative to, to sexual reproduction that will produce that spore or that, fertile, that egg, unreduced egg, with a life cycle reset without going through sex. Again, the same type of thing happens here. We're missing apomyosis, or missing meiosis and syngamy. So in the eukaryote life cycle, we have things like uh, plants that can be induced to undergo an early flowering by stress, meiosis and syngamy, stress-tolerant seeds are produced. We also have uh, in many organisms, not just plants but animals, where there's no stress, we have apomyosis occurring. In aphids and a number of insects as well as, as in Daphnia, a water flea, we have what's called cyclical apomix, apomixis where both sex and apomixis occur in the same organism, and when, uh, when this organism is confronted with stress, it will produce sexual males and females that then will produce eggs and sperm that unite to form a, an egg that can overwinter or can dry down in the, in the sand, in the, in the dry mud, and then when it's moist again, it will hatch as an apomictic organism. So the capacity to do both in cyclical apomix. We have a number of plants that have tendencies towards cyclical parthenogenesis, meaning that under very favorable conditions, most of the seeds on the plant form by apomixis. Under stressful conditions, most of the seeds form by sex. So stress, again, inducing an increase in sexual reproduction and maybe a phenomenon that existed long ago and has, been, has evolved into plants. Okay. Aphids, uh, recently there's been work, work because with an aphid, you can take from the same genotype, you can have sexually reproducing aphids 
or, or apomictically reproducing aphids, you can shorten their photo period or apply stress from that same apomictic mother, she will produce now progeny that are reproducing sexually. Exact same genotype and the expression profiling in this study that they were showing, uh, and this is just a copy out of their paper, the genes that are upregulated during apomixis in the aphid are post-transcriptional regulation. I'm sure you probably cannot see that very well. But a number of genes that are involved in post-transcriptional regulation, epigenetic regulation, cell cycle genes. Uh, this was a paper published earlier this year on aphids. And this chart here is, could have been taken out of our work with the plant, uh, with the plant uh, uh, Bukhara. Bukhara is a relative of Arabidopsis and shows very similar, almost identical patterns in, in the sense that post-transcriptional regulation genes are differentially expressed between apomictic and sexual Bukhara. Uh, epigenetic regulation genes and cell cycle genes are differentially expressed. Many of the same gene ontology categories as we see in animals we found to be differentially expressed in plants. So this idea that apomixis is not a mutation of the sexual pathway, it's an ancient program, possibly as ancient as meiosis, is a new thought, a new concept, that's just now being, being uh, introduced as a possible explanation for what apomixis is, an alternative to, to sex that is preferred by organisms under favorable conditions and sexual reproduction is preferred in uh, under stressful conditions. And so why did organisms give up apomixis during deep, ev deep evolution? We don't know. We don't know why, but clearly most organisms gave up that capacity, or at least it's very deeply buried in their genome for parthenogenesis and, and, and uh, apomixis. We think it's very deeply buried in all of our genomes. Okay. So this is a paper. Uh, this is a sentence from, I think this is the last sentence in, in this particular paper by Gallet. Our results show that asexual and sexual oogenesis in aphids share common genetic programs but diverge by adapting specificities in their respective gene expression profiles in germ cells and oocytes. I could essentially plagiarize that sentence for our research, and, and instead of saying oogenesis, I could say meiosis and an embryo sac formation in Daphnia and the rest of it uh, germ cells works, uh, but the rest of the sentence basically would work also for plants, plants and animals. Okay. Uh, so let's turn to plants now. That's just kind of an introduction of what apomixis, we think apomixis is. A lot of, you know, it's still, we don't know for sure. But in, apom uh, but in plants, we see the phylogeny of plants going back, back to the white, uh, the glycophytes, the white algaes, rhodophytes, red algae, we do have a form of apomixis there, a first division restitution. It's a form of, of asexual, uh, asexual egg formation. And then we have, in, in a lot of the algae here, we see forms of apomixis occurring. Uh, we get up into some of these interesting ones, the, all the way down here into polypodiopsida. Those are ferns. Those are our ferns. 10% of our ferns go through a form of apomixis called apospory. Apospory, 10% of ferns. It's a huge, huge frequency. Apospory is one of the major mechanisms of apomixis, probably the most common mechanism in angiosperms, in monocots and dicots, 
eudicots. It's, it's a very common form of aphomixis here. And uh, interestingly, it's the formation of a gametophyte, a gametophyte generation from a cell other than the germline cell. And it's very possible that it was inherited from the polypodiopsida uh, by angiosperms. Okay. So now we get a little closer to home. This is a chart of the phylogeny of the panicoid, panicoid grasses. In the Panaceae tribe, we have lots of apomictic organisms, apomictic grasses. All of these have apomixis in them. And if you look, where maize and sorghum, andropogon, where they evolved from, they evolved from this stem that was highly apomictic. And if you follow over here, we have danthonias that are apomictic. We can go into some of these other groups and find apomixis, in, in, not, not here, but in some of these other groups. So what does that say about sorghum and maize? That it evolved from a, a phylogenetic lineage that was rich in apomixis. We recently published a paper, 2011, where, where we, I, we did phenotyping of about 540 genotypes of sorghum. Many of those sorghum genotypes I collected from a trip to Icrasat in 2000, where I visited, I think with Red, Reddy, uh, a, a sorghum breeder that advised me to get germplasm from uh, as, as diverse a possibility as, as possible. If we're going to screen for apple mixis or its tendencies. We, 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 he helped me identify lines from China, from Australia, from, of course, from Africa and from India. But through his advice, I identified 10 or 12 lines, I believe, that we were then able to bring bring over into the United States where so we could grow them and phenotype them. So what we find in sorghum is we find a pospery. We do sorghum is not apomictic. There's been no publication that I am aware of where apomixis has been completely documented in sorghum. And the only way to do that is molecularly. There's been some pictures published, there's been claims, but there's not been a documentation of apomyosis and parthenogenesis. Apomyosis in the form of, of a pospery is well documented now in sorghum. So we think that the, the tendency for apomyxis that we see in sorghum is probably ancestral, that somewhere in its evolution it has lost the capacity for a full apomixis or at least has suppressed that capacity. If it has only suppressed the capacity, then we just need to figure out how to unsuppress it. And we know by breeding and by environmental treatments we can see that frequency of a posprey go up and down from 10 to 20 percent I've never seen it above 20% in any of our plant material. So we know that environment has something to do with it. Okay. So a posprey and sorghum, this is kind of what it looks like. We have here the sexual tetrad is forming. To the side in the new cellar cell, we see enlargement of a new cellar cell. And that new cellar cell in a apomictic Apospirous plants will completely uh, degenerate, cause degeneration of the sexual process. And here we have a posporous embryo sac. This one may be the sexual embryo sac, but the apospirous one in, a, in an apomictic, apospirously apomictic plant will replace it. And a fornucleate apospirous embryo sac replacing the sexual embryo sac. <clears throat> In sorghum, apospirously produced eggs are sexually functional because when we pollinate one of these apospirous lines, again only 15% apospory, we get triploids, B3 hybrids. That's pretty common. 
Uh, so we're not, we don't know if parthenogenesis occurs. It hasn't been con convincingly demonstrated, but it, it may exist. We just haven't seen it. One of the interesting things we, pu we published in our paper in 2011 was, was that whenever, when we had a prosperous genotypes, meaning they're producing 5, 10, 15 percent of their, of their ovules, those seeds are producing an aposporous embryo sac, the whole process of reproduction is accelerated. And what I mean by that is that the whole sexual process and apospirous process will occur in an ovule at an earlier stage of ovule development than in a corresponding line with no apospory. And we documented that by measuring ovule curvature, the curvature of the ovule in sorghum and the ovule will, will grow from a meristem and then as it matures it will curve over. We see in the apospirous lines meiosis and apospirous embryo sac formation, but meiosis occurring earlier in that bud, the ovule bud, based on curvature, than we see in the sexual lines. This was a total surprise to us, but we saw it across all of these uh, accessions, across uh, 78 accessions and multiple genotypes within each accession. We saw it within an F2 mapping population, and basically this little blue bar here is where we see most apospory, so it's occurring at an earlier stage embryo sac formation occurring at an earlier stage than in the non apospirous lines uh, and meiosis occurring at an earlier stage. We saw it in the F2 population and we saw it in a real population from Texas A&M produced by uh, Patricia Klein and her group. And we saw that in this rec uh, F F8 recombinant inbred line uh, population. So it's interesting it kind of makes sense that apple mixus being a mechanism to rapidly replace itself under favorable conditions that apple mixus might cause an, a rapid onset of reproductive processes whether they're sexual or apomictic. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go over that. The microarray that we used and we started developing this back in 2005 using ESTs, 12,000 of them, uh, and we had, of those 12,000 ESTs, in our ovules we had 96 percent of the, of the probes uh, showing expression above a two standard deviation background. Well, we converted those ESTs over to Arabidopsis genes, or, or we didn't convert them, but we s determined what they were in terms of Arabidopsis and found about 60, nearly 6,400 genes that had a good, good uh, uh, homology to Arabidopsis genes, and we used that, used that, that those data to identify gene ontology categories that were differentially expressed. We ought, we I we dissected out the ovules out of about 3,400 uh, uh, pistols and this is an ovule, and we did that with two sibs, an apospirous sib, this is a, an F2 population we made ourselves, 14 percent of ovules were producing apospirous embryo sacs, and then another sib, after looking at over 300 ovules in the right stage, we saw no apospory. Uh, we looked at three different stages, the MMC, megaspore mother cell, then the MMC undergoing meiosis, and then the four nucleate embryo sac stage is, is what we, we dissected out. We had five replications of each of these stages for each of the apospirous and non-apospirous. And so we had some pretty good replication on this project. Isolated the RNA and and then did the microarrays and the statistical analyses. <clears throat> so the results. What I'm showing here are, on this red dot, are genes that were differentially expressed. 
in the, in the non-apospirous line. The blue line happens to be the, the line uh, where there is apospory. And we saw, interestingly, we saw far less uh, gene, gene, gene expression variation among the apospirous line than we saw in the sexuals. So quickly, now if we compare the apospirous MMCs with the sexual MMCs, we find chromatin remodeling genes that are upregulated in the sexual ovules or downregulated in the posporous ovules. <clears throat> and so something different is happening in terms of this, this reprogramming for meiosis and, and syngamy in, in the formation of a posporous embryo sex. Nine genes were downregulated. Uh, <clears throat> this is a little different comparison where we're comparing stage two only between the uh, non apospirous and apospirous. And we find some, some interesting genes here involved in brass and steroid pathways. Uh, the biggest difference was in embryo sac four between the apospirous and the non apospirous. And here we found 229 genes downregulated in the sexual ovules, 54 enriched gene ontology categories, meaning these 229 genes belonged to categories uh, at a higher, at these enriched categories at a higher frequency than would be expected by chance alone. That's what we call by it, that's what we call it, an enriched gene ontology category. So here we see uh, some interesting response to various stimuli. And so if our idea of apomixis as being a response, or at least sexual reproduction as a response to stress, we have evidence of, of that occurring in, in sorghum. So con conclusions we, we see in the sexual ovules, 18-fold, more gene expression dynamics going on. 525 genes being differentially expressed, and this is within the non-apospirous. In the apospirous, we only see 29 genes differentially expressed between stages. Response to stimuli genes, the apospirous ovules are, appear to be fairly upregulated at all stages. Sexual ovules only upregulated stage one and two. Differences in, in hormones, responses, brass and steroid, jasmonic acid, <clears throat> and VIP, involved in early flowering. It's an important uh, methylator of histones. It was correlated with early onset of meiosis and early onset of embryo sac formation in the apospirous lines. Uh, Another methylation-specific gene that's downregulated in the phosphorus ovules required for meiosis. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about, about sorghum. Our model system that we are really fascinated with is called, is the genus Bukra. Bukra is a close relative of Arabidopsis. It can hybridize with the Arabidopsis. We used Affymetrix microarrays to study gene expression. Arabidopsis Affymetrix microarrays. And they, they worked very, very nicely. We've done quite a bit of sequencing in Bukra and compared it to Arabidopsis genes. Most genes are 100, nearly 100% identical. Maybe uh, we found some genes of course, the genes we are sequencing tend to be highly conserved genes, but maybe we see at the lowest 95% homology. Okay. Bukra is interesting because it produces apospirous embryo sacs in addition to diplosporous embryo sacs. The difference in diplospory, diplosporous form of apomixis, 
the megaspore mother cell, instead of undergoing meiosis as in a sexual plant, it this forms into an embryo sac or it has a first division restitution and divides mitotically and then forms into an embryo sac. So it avoids meiosis that way. In apospory, we have a, na a neighboring cell that develops into the embryo sac. And we see both of these occurring in Bukhara, which makes it a very interesting material. Uh, the first division restitution is most common in Bukhara. Instead of getting four spores, we get two spores. And this is a diagram of the pod. It's called a silique, and these are individual little seeds that will be forming inside there. They send, tend to get to this two-stage uh, uh, after apomyosis, their mitotic-like division, and they just seem to sit there. And then, then all of a sudden, all of them kind of progress together and go through embryo sac formation and parthenogenetic embryo formation. The sexual process, the megaspore mother cell goes through mitosis, forms a, my, uh, a tetrad, and then embryo sac will formation, and the egg cell will form in the mature ovule. So uh, we did expression profiling. We dissected out these little ovules, tiny, tiny, tiny ovules, from about 20,000 ovules. And then we did a pistol experiment where we just dissected out pistols. Pistols are a lot easier <laughs> to dissect out than ovules. Some of the, ov the ovules, just, just for an idea, the ovule is uh, at these stages, the earliest stage, is about one millimeter uh, long. I mean the, the pistol, the, excuse me, the pistol or the ovary is about one millimeter long. And in some of our uh, uh, bukra, we have 160 to 180 ovules inside. So dissecting those out under a dissecting scope and accumulating them in, in our RNA later and then extracting the messenger RNA, it was a very tedious project. So we did the uh, RNA and array procedures, uh, basically standard procedures, and we used the AFI-1 gene chip to analyze the differences. The differences were at four stages, an MMC stage, early, early pre, premiotic stage to MMC, uh, myocyte stage, the early post-myosis stage, embryo sac formation stage, and then uh, mature embryo sac stage. And these are the four stages we looked at in the apomictic and sexual uh, bukra. And here, we're, where it's not like sorghum, where, where apomixis uh, is not a complete process. In bukra, it's complete, uh, high, almost obligate, in the lines that we were looking at. Okay, data analysis. The, the more interesting things now are what did we find? We found uh, MMC, and this is going now back to pistols up here, where we just dissected out the pistols, and these really are our most recent data. We just, just this year, we got these data, and so all of this is in preparation now at this point. We saw s signaling related genes <coughs> that were upregulated in Bukhara stricta, which is the sexual. So here's the sexual. 1,346 genes upregulated in the sexual. And by the way, this is across stages. Uh, an analysis and the presentation of all stages would be too lengthy of a presentation. So that's across stages in the sexuals. A protein synthesis, meiosis, uh, there were eight GO categories related to meiosis. In, this, in the apomict, we have again some signaling gene ontology categories that were different from stricta. Small RNA mediated gene silencing was very important in the apomictic side of things. Response to stimuli 
we had response to stimuli up here, but mostly it was redox signaling. Re uh, and, and among these gene ontology categories were things like oxidative stress, response to oxidative stress. Uh, and we, we find in um, Volvox, which is an ancient algae, it's, an, it's, a, it's a cyclical apomic. The first product of stress in Volvox that throws it out of its apomixis cycle and into a sexual cycle is accumulation of hydrogen peroxide. In fact, you can take a parthenogenetically, or yeah, an apomictic Volvox, treat it with uh, hydrogen peroxide and induce it to go, go through its sexual cycle, induces the genes for, for sex. So interestingly, we found these, these genes here, the redox signaling, as being an important component of the sexual pathway. Signal transduction, uh, some interesting genes involved with intracellular signal transduction. Calmodulin, calcium, seems to be an important gene. Uh, a part of that, the calmodulin process in the mitochondria is part of the, of the re reactive oxygen pathway, the oxidative stress signaling pathways. So it's interesting, an interesting finding. Oxidative stress now, we have response to oxidative stress, highly, highly uh, significant. 135 genes on, on, in our list of differentiated genes belong to response to stress, 29 of those to reactive response to oxidative stress out of 290 on the chip. So the probability of that happening by chance alone are these value, p-values over here. Respiratory chain, a lot of this interesting things. Response to oxidative stress, these are now individual genes. These are the identifiers in the affymetrics system. Meiosis genes, this is fascinating. It goes along with the aphid study. The aphid study, as you recall, said we're using the same genes, but we're just regulating them differently to get first division restitution in aphids. Same thing in, daf in Bukra. We've got the same, same genes being expressed, but at different levels. These are all down-regulated. DMC1 is a very important gene for meiotic recombination, only during meiosis. And these are all down-regulated in the apomix. What's well, down regulating them? Maybe if we know the answer to that, we we have will be closer to being able to engineer apomixis. Now, if we move on to ovules, the data gets even more interesting. We have here a comparison between sexual Bucra formosa and apomictic B lignifera at the on the ovule stage. Stress and again redox signal, jasmonic acid signaling. Interestingly, in the number of studies, uh, jasmonic acid is a communicator of redox stress and is cor correlated with the induction of, of, of sexual reproduction. And so we see these being upregulated in the sexuals or downregulated in the apomix. <clears throat> Photosynthesis development. Uh, an interesting thing here in these in these ovules is upregulation of male associated processes or alternatively the downregulation of maleness in the apomix. The apomix don't need males and they so they don't they don't devote their energy into producing genes that are associated with maleness. This is the apomix over here, small RNA mediated gene sciencing Chromatin remodeling, gene ontology categories, post-transcriptional gene regulation. This looks like it's an amazing story. We now know machinery that's differentially expressed. The chromatin remodeling, post-transcriptional gene regulation machinery is all there and being differentially expressed. We don't know what that machinery is processing. And we have a hint that it's transposons and transposon genes that are being differentially expressed and involved in the process 
It's just a guess. It's just a hypothesis at this point. Cell cycle regulation, floral development genes uh, being upregulated. Uh, female type floral development, ovule gynese, female gynaceum types of genes being upregulated in the apomic, whereas mostly male types of things going on. Response to oxidative stress, some, some interesting genes over here. Uh, not going to take time to go through them. Regulation of gene expression epigenetic. I listed the argonauts first because everybody's interested in argonauts. And they're there. They're part of the machinery of remodeling the chromatin. They're part of the machinery for, for, for dicing of messenger RNAs. And, and various forms of those regulation are represented here. Dicer are like two and three. EMF2, EMF2 uh, is related to phi, the fertilization independent seed gene. So these are some interesting genes that we're, we're seeing that are differentially regulated. Uh, ovules, again, this is a, another combination with Formosa versus Microphylla. This is the one that does both diplospory and apospory. And again, the same. Same genes being upregulated in the in the sexual redox signaling, uh, and just I just want to point out, and I know my time's getting close to the end, and I'm close to the end of the slides, but I want to point out that this redox signaling and stress response is not anything we did to the plants in preparation. In fact, in our second experience, when we first saw these data. The next time we grew them, we made sure every single plant that was sampled was very, very healthy under the most ideal of conditions. So what we're seeing here is a cellular response. Uh, and we, uh, we, we don't know why it's there other than possibly it's required to induce sexual meiosis and so forth. Uh, again, in the microphylla, same type of thing, small RNA mediated gene sciencing in the apomict. We have eight sexual buchra and eight apomictic buchra. And we're now starting to do small RNA sequencing on, on, in these plants. And from that, we hope to see what the machinery for chromatin remodeling is working with. What is it using to, to, to modify the, the genome? Okay, so in conclusion, we see apple mixes as a life cycle renewal from single cells without meiosis and syngamy. In, it, in its evolutionary context, text, it may have been, may have evolved simultaneously with meiosis as a mechanism for rapidly filling the environment with progeny. You don't have to slow down for sexual processes. Stress-induced meiosis would cause spores, uh, desiccation-tolerant spores or desiccation-tolerant uh, zygospores that, uh, uh, that, that would then, when they came upon favorable conditions again, would renew the life cycle. Sexual and apomictic development in aphids, sorghum, and buchra involve, involves differential expression of inter- and intracellular signal transduction genes, genes that may, these are pathways, signal transduction pathways that are telling the plant to reproduce sexually or apomictically. Chromatin remodeling genes, post-transcriptional gene regulation genes. <clears throat> The existence of an ancient sex apple mix of switch is inferred by our data, especially when we see it going spanning kingdoms from, from plants and animals in the same types and same go categories being differentially expressed. The, uh, so that's an interesting possibility that there is an ancient switch that is within an organism. Okay, highly conserved and cyclical apple mix, like the, like the aphid. The switch is highly conserved, if, it, if it's true, 
if the hypothesis is correct, then the aphid has inherited this ability to respond to its environment with the reproductive switch, re reproductive change. In plants, we see facultative apple mix, and we see some facultative apple mix that produce more seed sexually under stress, and under favorable conditions, most of their seed are produced apomictically. So here we would say that the sex apple mix switch has been moderately conserved in, in evolution, and then poorly conserved switch is what we see in obligate sexual organisms like us, and in obligate apomictic organisms, such as many of the lizards and fish and, and uh, some, some other animals that have lost the capacity for sexual reproduction but are obligately ap apomictic. And finally, why are we looking at all of this? Well, biologically, it's all very, very interesting. But if we can elucidate the mechanisms of apomixis, and if we can el elucidate the mechanisms of this hypothesized sex apomixis switch, then maybe we can go to sorghum and maize and pigeon pea and all these wonderful crops that you work on here. Maybe we can tinker with that switch, turn sexual reproduction on for breeding purposes, wouldn't that be wonderful? So, and then turn it on to apple mixes when we have that desired product of breeding and give it to the world. I mean, that's, isn't that our dream, isn't it? So that's my dream anyway. That's why I've been working on it for 32 years. <laughs> Hope to see it happen in my lifetime. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, John. Questions, please. Thank you, John. I enjoyed your presentation, but I have a few set of questions. <clears throat> when you did blast in uh, for this one, uh, genes of uh, sorghum and the Arabidopsis, you used the E value of you know, 5 into you know, 10 to the power of minus 2 order. Generally, we go for an order of 10 to the power of minus 9 E value. Minus 90? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned only minus two. Minus twenty or minus two. Yeah. Oh, we is that what I had up there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we, we we looked at it the whole spectrum, you know, and and looked at and, and things started dropping off as we hit minus ninety. Mm, I'm not sure how high we went. Yeah, it was, it was just for presentation. Yeah, but you would recommend in terms, we're getting ready to publish this, the value we should use for publication would be more like e to the minus 90. I mean minus 90. That's right. Yes, an e value. Okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, you narrowed down to 29 genes uh, no, related to Yapospori. And uh, probably your slides did not explain how much... Uh, or down regulation in terms of the fold, though you mentioned you have taken more than two SD, SCD, uh, those numbers. Yes. Uh, but uh, I could not make out, maybe no. probably I should uh, read your paper. <laughs> yes. Uh, that is one. And uh, this jasmonic acid synthesis genes uh, are also differentially expressed in most of the defense response conditions. But I don't know how they are uh, maybe related here. And when you combine the results of the, uh, no, both the species uh, and uh, what pointer you can make uh, towards finding out uh, this uh, switch between uh, uh, sex and uh, hypomixis. Mm. And further, uh, do you see any parallels with the work of uh, your collaborator Sundaresh Ganeshan, who is also a collaborator with Imran Siddiqui of CCMB, who did uh, considerable work on uh, hypomixis in Arabidopsis? The approach is different. Uh, our approach is trying to understand it from a natural perspective, and other people are saying, let's see if we can engineer a, an apple mixus de novo. So let's see if we can create an apple mixus, a synthetic apple mixus, by moderating gene expression in meiosis and inducing a parthenogenesis. So uh, in terms of 
comparing profiling from other laboratories in our lab, we see a lot of similarity. We see a lot of, of, of uh, genes that are involved with stress response, differentiating sexual from apomictic reproduction in other laboratories in Bukra and in some of the paspalum, uh, uh, so, some of the panicoid grasses, we see these genes po poking up. In many cases, we see evidence of large global shifts in gene regulation and gene expression between apomixis and sexual reproduction. But both, let me just finish with one more comment. The, the end product is so important, it justifies pursuing several different pathways. We can create a synthetic apomixis that works. Let's do it, I think. I, I, from a biology and biologist standpoint, I'm interested in understanding the mechanisms naturally and the natural mechanisms, and especially if this is a process that may be as complicated as meiosis, uh, it may be needed. Even if we have some genes that turn, turn off meiosis and get an unreduced embryo sac, but there's, if there's no, no shift in the chromatin remodeling that is required for parthenogenesis, then the natural, understanding the natural process could be maybe combined with the synthetic process at some point to make it work. Um, having worked so much on apomixis, I was wondering if there are any examples in legumes? No. I'm sorry. The closest thing to it is in a trifolium where there's been an observation of an apospirous embryo sac <laughs> in a publication in the early 90s, I believe, but it's a it's an a it's an odd situation for such a huge family not to have any apomixis among them. And can I ask one more? Mm -hmm. And what do you think apomixis would be a natural process? It's or it's more an induced one when there is a cross. You know, it's more an induced. Or do you think because of the experience with grasses, is it a natural process that apomictic embryo sacs form and then there is apomixis? My, uh, my opinion is that it's a natural process, that it's, uh, an acci it, it's uh, not an accident, but it is, it's, an, it's a natural ancient process that accidentally occurs. And that we see it in sorghum is a good example. We see this fairly high frequency, 20%, 15%, published up to 25% in science in 1970. First real excitement about apomixis and sorghum came from a science publication. But there, I'm, I think the data is, from a phylogenetic standpoint, is consistent with the idea that that sorghum evolved from plants, ancestors that had the capacity for both, both, and it, and it has lost the capacity for a full functioning apomixis along the way. So a natural process is my feeling, my opinion, that it's natural. Now, another, another aspect of this, in red algae, people have crossed sexual red algae from different parts of the world, and their hybrid is apomictic. Uh, we see that in animals as well. We see hapomixis occurring from hybrids between different snails uh, that are sexual. Uh, there's lots of examples of, in all different kingdoms of apomixis occurring as a result of, of hybridization. And if you think about it, the genomes coming together and colliding and all that regulation from different genomes and different uh, mitochondrial background, cytoplasmic inheritance is, is different. And when those come together, lots of weird things happen. Yes? Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. I think that I think in angiosperms is an excellent group of of organisms because there's so much apple mixes across across all 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 of the angiosperms. I didn't have the slide here, but I have a slide that shows the phylogenetics of all angiosperms according to the latest uh, angiosperm phylogenetic working group analyses. And we see apple mixes in the basal angiosperms as well as the most derived angiosperms and everything anywhere everywhere in between. And whole groups, rosaceae, ro rosids, that whole section has a lot of apple mixes in it. And so we do have examples in literature of people identifying hybrids that uh, the parents were sexual and the hybrid is, is apomictic. That suggests that there's a switch that we can elucidate to turn the genes up or down. The genes being the same for sex and apomixis, but the regulation of those are somehow differentially expressed. Yes. Most of these are epigenetic regulations, sometimes the iron is part of the process. How do you relate the smaller the society, the smaller the regulations across angiosperms, not as a sort of but the epigenetic regulations? Because that's a big area. Mm -hmm. So the question is on the role of small RNAs. We're working in Bukhara, and uh, uh, Dr. Ga Gal from Gale, G A E L from uh, Shrin from University of, of Delhi, I believe. He's working in Penicetum, and has identified like eighteen thousand. 18,000 small RNAs that are differentially expressed, some of that are unique to the apomictic penicetum and some unique to the sexuals. But the vast majority of them are in the uh, apomictic ones. He gave a lecture just last week. So they are probably the furthest along in terms of pursuing the, uh, the differential expression of small RNAs. They sequenced those. Um, there are reports out of Argentina in plants, a penicetum uh, paspalum, I believe, paspalum, where there are unique uh, transposable elements that are expressed only in the apple mix. Um, I don't know other than that. There was a there was a report that um, transposons had been done away with in certain animal apple mix, but that turned out not to be correct. They were still maintaining certain transposons, had all the all the machinery for sexual reproduction, but had been apomictic for 50 million years, but retaining the the machinery. Uh, the genes necessary for meiosis. Somehow maybe using those genes uh, for apple meiosis. We don't, but how it all fits together with small RNAs and chromatin remodeling, we, we don't know. But that's, it's time to design some, really design some experiments with people with the skills to design those experiments, which goes beyond my level. <laughs> It's a collaboration. Collaboration is really what's needed between scientists from with strong backgrounds in multiple areas. Mm -hmm.